All right, take two. All right. December 11th, 2011, my name is Jerry Whiting. I own Azalea Software, but today I'm here to speak about computer security to my sisters and brothers in Occupy Wall Street, Occupy Seattle, and Occupy Everywhere, as well as the people in the land of the snow, the Tibetan community, with whom I stand in solidarity. So, with that behind us, let's talk about protecting our assets from the man. So, uh, to repeat myself, given our interruption, I own Azalea Software, we print barcodes. I've been doing that for 20 plus years. Uh, barcodes as a format include things like parity patterns and lookup tables, compression, and, and they're a way to encode information, in, uh, uh, albeit in, in glyphs and graphic symbols. But the same uh, questions and inquisitiveness led me to ask about encryption. Through an old friend, David Sobel, uh, I was introduced to Bruce Schneier, um, and long story short, we ended up publishing the first commercial version of Blowfish. Uh, of Blowfish? Of Blowfish. A, uh, at the time, they were talking about like 14 years ago, the debate was between 56 and 64-bit DES uh, and export controls, and the belief was that the NSA wasn't going to sign off on anything they couldn't break themselves. And so it was assumed that they could, have, they could break both 56 and 64-bit DES. So we said, basically, fuck you, and leapt to a <coughs> encryption algorithm that used a 448-bit key. Um, which meant that it was virtually unbreakable by any known means. Given that we um, had a, um, not just an encryption engine as a DLL, but uh, an API in a file format, and we owned 1-800-ENCRYPT and encryption.com, the NSA paid us a visit. So we ended up getting an export permit for DES, um, so I've had the visit by the NSA. Um, since then, you know, before, during, and after that, I've had a political involvement parallel to many of the people at this table. And um, uh, so my interest in crypto translates into how do we increase our individual and collective security through guarding our own data and preventing eavesdropper, eavesdroppers and the bad guys from doing things that we don't approve of, uh, to put it bluntly. So, um, I've envisioned this talk as being a two-part thing, that this is a uh, lay of the land, an overview, an introduction of vocabulary and basic principles with an emphasis on three areas, risk analysis and the appropriate response, uh, um, traffic analysis in terms of network traffic and behavioral patterns and cryptanalysis, and the third thing being uh, key generation and key management. I envision at least one more follow-up session which will be uh, uh, encryption, hashes and encryption, primitives and protocols. The timing of that will be after I finish some work I'm doing so that I can present the theoretical in terms of hashes like SHA-256 and encryption like Blowfish and AES, but also present you with a suite of usable tools um, with reference implementation so that the theoretical is complemented by hands-on, let's do it, let's rock and roll, let's roll our own shit. So uh, I'm working on it now, the code that is. Um, the background material for this talk and all future efforts can be followed at jetcityorange.com slash crypto, jetcityorange.com slash crypto. So, uh, hopefully, this is the first time I've taught this syllabus. I've, I've been running it over my head for months. As I said, I was going to teach it in Dharamsala the month of December this month. Uh, uh, things intervened, but this is a two-pronged thing where I get to share this knowledge with the Occupy community as well as the Tibetan community, two, two bangs for one buck. So, time for the glasses. I have notes. Um, hopefully it'll be presented in chunks. Stop me when you want. Um, but um, as I said, this first section is an overview with the three-pronged attack, or three, three prongs of the uh, syllabus. Um, risk analysis, appropriate response, um, key generation, key management, and traffic analysis. So when I say computer, 
Um, I wish to use a generalized term that includes computers, smartphones, tablets, routers, switches, hubs, Arduino powered uh, Lego mashups that are now Toys 10. Anything that is part of your infrastructure, any gadget you have, there is some level of vulnerability, there is some expectation of privacy, there should be an indi individual responsibility for controlling your data as, as well as your interaction with the larger world, and uh, there it should be some inherent approach to security and, um, and, uh, and crypto inherent in anything you do. So I'm going to use the term computer, but let's get under the first vocabulary thing is that is a generalized term to cover our gadgets. In my mind, my G2 is the computer in my pocket that runs Linux and happens to make phone calls. The phone calls is about fourth or fifth on the list. The next distinction I'd like to make in vocabulary and, and for terms of this discussion is the difference between computer security and computer safety. While the two often overlap and they should be part of an, a coherent um, a game plan and overview, there are issues that are about physical plants and who can leave fingerprints on your stuff. There are issues about access control. Um, and yes, that bleeds into keyloggers being installed in your machine, but there's going to be a distinction or a line of demarcation in the discussion between issues of physical security and physical assets, and uh, safety rather, and the issue of security as it relates to encryption and hashes and protocols and workflows. They're intertwined, but there is a distinction. So the easiest thing to address is this idea of security uh, as a, a function of safety. So your physical plant, um, close the windows, lock the door, there should be a smoke detector, a fire extinguisher. These are safety issues. Let's start with the door. Locks in this discussion will be both physical locks that you have keys on your key ring as well as crypto locks like encryption. But there are many uh, uh, analogies that are pretty much one-to-one -one, as well as some distinctions between the tangible um, locksmith uh, master's combo tumbler thing and those crypto things. Um, but the issue of who has access to the keys is germane to both discussions. So if you're establishing what I'm going to call a pod, a server room, a facility for, the, for Occupy, both informal and formal, the first thing is where is it and who has access to it? If it's in a building that's being repurposed, uh, you may want to rekey the, the lock uh, because you don't know the lineage of that key. You don't know who's got it. Um, and then uh, obviously having a reputable locksmith, etc., etc. If um, this is a semi-public space, if it isn't a bunker or anything less than that, the idea of alarms and intrusion control, um, uh, access control and intrusion alerts, it can be as simple as a webcam set up as a baby monitor or motion detector that uh, texts or emails people and lets you look at what's going on inside. Um, If you can't control access to your physical device, you have a whole other discussion. When you've got Tom Cruise suspended like a motherfucking marionette dropping onto your keyboard, we have a whole different discussion going on. So we can laugh about Hollywood FX, but if you look at Stuxnet that shut down the centrifuges, someone walked in with a USB device, and if that person's identity is compromised, that person is in a bit somewhere. So the idea of access control, you know, it isn't given enough credence in my humble opinion in many scenarios, even while a nascent embryonic movement, Occupy and the rest of our allies need to keep access control at whatever level uh, primary in consideration in establishing a physical presence. Um, Things need to be plugged in. If you're setting up a pod, you need to have the surge protector with the battery backup in between. You need to protect whatever you deem is uh, critical to your infrastructure. Um, I'm going to sidestep the discussion of routers and firewalls. It's a different kettle of fish, but it's that one area that goes from intrusion in a, in a physical sense into a digital sense. It's almost that bridge between safety and security. If there is a printer, there needs to be a shredder. 
If you're going to recycle the shredded material, I would cut it up and shred the material in a shuffled fashion so no one can dumpster dive any one facility. Better yet, burn it after you shred it. So uh, uh, we move into sort of a philosophical discussion here. Uh, to, to quote Willie Sutton, why do you rob banks? Because that's where the money is. So why does someone a attack your infrastructure or your assets? Because there's something there that your adversary thinks is valuable. So if you have something of value to someone, if you have something that you deem of value, there is probably someone else who shares that view of it being valuable, but probably doesn't share your motivation and your best interests. So you need to be honest about evaluating, that's too many, you need to be honest about the value of your assets. You need to do an, 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 uh, a, uh, an audit of things like your mailing list, your press contacts, your email server, your membership list, your financial records, as well as the router switches, hubs, computer servers, mouse, mice, monitors, etc., etc. You need to be, and the reason you do that is manyfold. Number one, you need to know what you got. You need to have an ongoing inventory. You need to look at those things as a group prioritize and categorize them according to their value and their utility, their replaceability, and also look at not just what it took, it took us a hundred hours of volunteer time to build up our mailing list, but the other question you need to ask is, in terms of valuation, what is it worth to replace that? What's the cost of that being compromised? What, what will it, what's the value of that, that, that database's integrity because if someone comes in and manipulates it, they don't have to delete it. They might inject their own name or change addresses to fuck up your postage and get too many returns or whatever. But you need to ask yourself this multifaceted question about the value of your digital assets. I mean, not only what they are, but what the value of, the, of those assets are and what the value, what the value is a very generic term. If they are compromised, what is the true cost? Like the TOC, the total cost of compromise. A very different concept. So there's also this, this question when you do an audit of your assets, not only do you know what you need to keep track of and protect, you're also going to rank them in some sort of valueized, uh, prioritized list. Obviously, you're going to spend your best efforts protecting your most valuable assets. But there's also a, a, a cost-benefit analysis going on. If something is worth a dollar, what are you going to spend to, to protect that asset? Probably no more than 99 cents. On the other hand, while it seems a trivial exercise, it is a question to ask yourself, you have to ask what your adversary is willing to spend to compromise that asset. So in the old days, we had to worry about script kiddies and bored little motherfuckers with antisocial behavior. Now, um, events have taught us that we need to worry about nation states on down. We need to worry about the NSA being in the phone closet, because they are. You need to worry about Mossad as well as, as about the, the UK infrastructure. And dear Lord, we all need to worry about the People's Liberation Army. If you look at a brute force attack against any security in the digital age whatsoever, the numbers are on the side of the Chinese. Let me repeat that. Not only do you have a quarter of the world's population, but you have a, a homogenous, unified, potentially unified force that can be brought to bear against an opponent in an unprecedented horsepower, human power, mixed power, by whatever metric you use. And we know that, for example, our sisters and brothers in Chinese are not always aligned with the interests that we share at this table. Or as we say in my house, they can sometimes be hard to love. So at a certain point, you have to make a, a, a trade-off between what you're willing to spend to protect an asset vis-a-vis -vis the, the, the value of that asset, but that comes out of discussion and a conclusion about what you need to protect, why, and what it's worth 
and what the cost of compromise is. So another set of questions that a group should ask itself, whether you're setting up a single Wi-Fi router or a whole server rack, who are your attackers? Why do they share, why do they agree that certain things are valuable and why are they uh, intent on taking those things away from you, corrupting those things, um, impersonating you with relation to that? You have a bank account that's ones and zeros. Somebody wants to impersonate you and take control of your account. You need to ask yourself, who are your attackers? What are their motivations? What are their resources they can bring to bear? How motivated are they? Anonymous, you could say, is contrarian. They have no budget, they have no formal structure, and yet they are quite effective in bringing to bear a collective attack against um, targeted adversaries. And I'm sure that it's caught many police departments in Texas on up unawares when they're, they're attacked by a non-force, this cloud sort of nefarious um, entity, uh, but we have to ask ourselves the same sorts of questions. Uh, you need to ask yourself, who is going to come after what of yours and why? What, what resources will they bring to bear on the problem? Will they bring money? Will they bring supercomputer clusters? Will they bring smart people? Will they bring allies of theirs? I would have to assume that the Occupy movement has attracted attention at a very high level around the world. If we have positioned ourselves as a 99% vis-a-vis the 1% ruling class, the man, we can only assume that a social media driven, internet based, digital revolution will be met uh, by that adversary tete-a-tete. Uh, 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 -tete. Fine by me. I say that knowing this up front with our eyes open as part of our planning process, methodology, and core values will ensure um, victory in the long run, but will also make it a lot more fun in the intervening years. At a certain point, you have to look at your assets and what you're trying to protect, flip your hat around backwards, and pretend that you're a bad guy or a bad gal and look at your vulnerabilities and ask yourself, how would I attack this? What have I forgotten? And this is a time where peer review, peer review, group think, and an open source mentality is a strong suit. A split personality works in this scenario. You want many eyes on the problem looking at either a physical uh, pod or server room, uh, informal or informal, a protocol, a piece of software, a workflow, or uh, one of the things I'm going to return to is this idea that as a tech sangha, part of our responsibility is to build tools and systems and platforms for our brethren and sisters to use, but also to instill the values and the individual responsibility vis-a-vis -vis computing that increase individual privacy and security while de uh, defining and, and, and uh, providing an open platform for peer-to-peer -peer, uh, transparent interactivity. So I think that we got to set examples and truly be a vanguard in a in a cultural sense as well as, my, as writing code. And that's really something that um, I think a lot of nerds and engineering types have forgotten uh, it works in the lab when I test it against the suite, therefore it must work, work in the real world, and yet you end up building a perfect crypto system and, and homeboy, homegirl puts the password on the post-it note on the screen. Why? Because we, we gave them a tool that they filled in in a very human way. You lay out a new campus and you lay out like stones in the lawn where people are supposed to walk between buildings, and two years later you come back, mofos have like cut banana peel shortcuts in your grass. Well, if you'd engineered it right, they wouldn't be putting the post-it note on the screen. And I'll come back to keys and whatnot, but I think part of what, we, what the Occupy movement can bring to bear on high-tech and human-computer interaction, at least in my humble opinion in the, the security model, is to instill 
habits and a culture and an awareness, and it's not just a rote awareness, but a true individual responsibility for taking control of those aspects of our digital lives that increase privacy, increase security, while at the same time, paradoxically, giving us an open platform to interact peer-to-peer -peer in an interactive manner. Unless I'm missing something here, and I, I don't think so. All right, okay, so... Um, so if you're going to do an, a, an audit of your assets and assign relative values to those, those assets, <clears throat> one action item after that is to, they're, gonna, they're probably going to organize themselves into pods or groupings. Perhaps you're Occupy, perhaps you're the Tibetan community, perhaps you're the Black Panther Party elders, perhaps you're a, a pea patch garden. There are going to be certain things like the membership list, while you don't want it on a billboard or a skywriter, you really don't care about that as much as you do the bank records, let's say. Or if you have an organization where you run hardware, the passwords to any um, office worker are one thing, the passwords the sysadmins use to get into the big boxes or something else again. My point being, you want to compartmentalize your risk and watch your assets self-organize into, into pods that you manage like a cell where only certain people need to know the bank and accounting passwords. And even within accounting, there are well-established protocols so that any one person can't embezzle the organization and run them dry. In the same way, in IT, we're all aware of um, policies, formal, and protocols, informal, like a launch code where you've got two keys and you can't jump in between. My point being that when you prioritize your assets after an audit, you then begin to cluster the protection needs into things that are assigned to work groups and individuals with confidence factors, risk factors, and appropriate policies in place. The upside of this is, if there is a violation, if any one password is violated, your exposure is limited by the, the footprint of that pod or that cluster. So if the sysadmins get compromised, you don't want your bank account drained. If someone's embezzling, you don't want uh, 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 logins to the building access code to go along with that. Let's talk about locks. And at this point, this is more digital locks than physical locks. You would think that the key to security is having a good lock that's secret from everyone else. I'm here to say that contrary to that, true security is in the key, not the lock. Good encryption software is open source, if not unencumbered by patents. You want peer review and lots of eyeballs looking at your code, looking at your math, looking at your implementation in context. I'll repeat that. You want peer review on your encryption and everything else, hash codes or whatever, that are um, peer review, whether there's patents on it, on it or not, but you want everyone to know not just the underlying math, but the, the code that does it and the application in context because any one of those can be a weak point. But the more eyes that are looking at the lock, the better the use of the key in that scenario is. The more, which is, so even in a proprietary world, pre eight so years ago when open source became the new black, the new hipster, People wanted to look at your crypto code to make sure there was no back door, but to also make it better by making contributions. This is not a weakness, this is a strength. And it isn't cultural and open source, it's a strength from a code and math point of view. The strength is in the key, which is why the end of this talk is going to talk about key strength and key management. Because fuck the lock, it's the key. How you generate them, how you store them, how you transmit and share them, these are true attack points. It ain't the lock. So the in inverse, the flip side is, when someone tells you they've got the best new encryption algorithm, run for the hills, brother. Run! Run! Take your children. Because until it has been looked at by the wizards, 
and before there has been a peer review, you can't trust anybody's stuff. Now, here's where Jerry gets a little paranoid. Uh, the new encryption standards were signed off by, you know, a national instant standards and technology and the whole infrastructure, which means the NSA signed off on them as well. Uh, uh, the advanced encryption standard uh, chose a, a cipher, very good, but I have to wonder about it because hello, there is that chance that if I was the NSA signing off on the federal crypto standard among five very good candidates, none of which were weak, what would I do? I would say, I'm going to sign off on the one that I can break, that I'm pretty sure my adversaries can't. So, there's nothing wrong with Ringdahl, it's a great cipher, it does the job, I'm going to write stuff for it, but I like Blowfish because it's just as good, if not better, who cares, at that thin fringe, they're, 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 they're equally viable candidates, but as the candidate that didn't win as a unpopular cipher, there's less cryptanalytic, uh, cryptanalytic effort being expended to break Blowfish, and therefore from a contrarian point of view, you're better off taking the dark horse because it's just as good for real wor world needs, and there's fewer tools and effort being directed at breaking it, in my humble opinion. Uh, but these are the kind of trade-offs that one can make, and I guess to take a step, the reason I'm, I'm taking this long-winded introduction, I want people to have a measured response to threats, both real and imagined. I want people to have the skills, the tools, and the confidence to evaluate what's in front of them and to respond appropriately, not a knee-jerk, soundbite, Fox News scare kind of thing. So a cipher has been compromised. Well, let's go back. Someone presented a paper that there are, is a potential attack against the math underlying this thing. Does that mean you should abandon it and run for the hills, chicken little sky? No, 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 no. It just means that there may theoretically be a way to needle into this thing. Um, but you need to be able to evaluate beyond the headlines and the scare tactics um, and to figure out what's going on and what your response should be. Uh, so again, the idea of um, of the, the security being in the key, not in the lock. Uh, obfuscation is not security. ROT13 is not encryption. You really need to understand that there are several factors when it relates to keys that relate to uh, how secure your system is overall. Hello. Hello. Hey. Hello. Hey. Hello. Hey. Some hugs around. Hello. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing? Oh. Hey, I'm good. Hi. How are you doing? Yes, ma'am. Okay. I got a Let's keep going. Okay, okay. Um, so why should I trust your encryption software is a valid question that anyone should ask. If the software implements the algorithm protocol correctly, it's up to you to use good keys. In fact, the bulk of the responsibility lies with the key holder, and that's the way it should be. So if that's theoretically true, we can agree on that at a math code level. It underlines this belief of mine that as a tech sangha we need to instill the values and culture of individual responsibility. We can write the best key in the world. It can be unbreakable by all known attacks, but if we don't implement it well and instill habits and workflow and patterns in our sisters and brothers who uh, end up using this, not only are our efforts for naught, we put people in a potentially compromised situation. I just throw this out there so that this idea of um, the cultural aspects of cryptography is part of any ongoing discussion. Cool? Um, so, there are two factors I'd like to focus on. 
the selection and use of good keys and good key behavior. Algorithms and habits. Math is one thing, but getting people to use good protocols is what makes it work. If we implement strong math, we need to teach others how to use it responsibly. Part of responsibility to our users is not only to set a good example, but to teach and instill responsible computing habits that reinforce individual responsibility in protecting openness, security, and privacy. As difficult an area to define as it is to implement. We are the tech vanguard and the people depend upon us. We are the tech vanguard. We need to foster a culture that respects privacy and openness, active participation in, on egalitarian terms, and a balance of power between the individual and all others favoring the former. This culture needs to instill secure protocols and safe habits. So let's think in terms of whole solutions. If you're going to do access control, you need to think about intrusion detection. If you're going to do intrusion detection, you need to have an alert system in place that handles exceptions. Because I don't want to know about the times when things are okay. I really need to know when things are broken. In fact, I want alerts on a dashboard in real time. Okay, so this we can stop at this point.